Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Buck McVaney with Industrial Kiln and Dryer. Welcome. Glad you guys have made it to our second session uh, on lubrication. We're going to kind of go around a little bit and introduce everybody that's got that's part of uh, or that is helping make this happen. We got Carl Elling with Whitmore. Carl. Good morning, everyone. How you doing? Happy Thursday. Uh, Bailey. You see that's uh, kind of managing the, 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 the thing in the background for us, keeping us straight. She's hey, guys. Sorry. Was on <laughs> <laughs> and then you got Jason Merzman. He's he's taking care of the technical stuff, and the, uh, the video and all the camera shots for us. If you guys have some questions as we go through this, we want to make sure that, that you, you know how to, and I think Jason's going to kind of walk us through that a little bit. Good evening, everyone. Um, I've just shared my screen, so I hope you all can kind of see that. I'll move it in a little bit more. Um, so you all have a menu bar that pops up to it. With that menu bar, there's a drop down that has questions. So if you click on that, you can come down here and type in your questions. And then you can select who you're sending it to, send all, send privately. Um, so if you do have any questions, by all means, you know, go on here, send us your questions, either myself or Bailey. Um, we'll try to, you know, get you an answer or we'll interject with Buck and Carl and we'll ask the question for you um, and hopefully they can get you an answer. If not, we'll always follow up um, with one of our CSRs and make sure that uh, you get the information that you need. Yep, thanks, Jason. We don't want anybody to... To get out of here we appreciate your time um, and the investment that you're making this we want to make sure that we get your questions answered so with that being said welcome to the second session we're going to talk specifically uh about gearing uh gear opinions change the drive systems carl's driving on, on, the, on the powerpoint so when you're ready carl copy that sir um here we go so uh this is part two of our second uh, session. So the first session was our basic lubrication as far as what was important on rotary. So we're gonna dive a little bit deeper uh, on this one. So let's rock and roll to get our day started. There we go. All right, so today's discussion, you know, rotary kills are using a wide a uh, range of mineral processing industries. So there's your typical uh, picture that we all recognize pretty well on cement plant, especially. So this one's gear driven as well. Uh, there's your support rollers, trainings, all that kind of good stuff. So that's what our topic of discussion is today. But these rotary vessels are also used in a wide different ranges of industries. So paper and pulp or, uh, you know, anything from your distilleries, uh, out there in cow signing, I mean, there's several uh, open gear applications out there uh, that we all uh, dryers, may be familiar with. Dryers, ball mills, uh, yep. obviously kilns, all kinds of driven methods, in all kinds of industries. Um, chain, uh, chain driven, gear and pinion, helical, spur, dual driven. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get into some of these different drive systems and lubrication points in this. Yep. All right. So, kind of like what Buck and I were already talking about. Um, this slide kind of goes over everything. It's not all inclusive, of course, but I mean, it gives you an idea as far as application. So, just to give you an idea, uh, depending on what market or industry that you're calling on, uh, there's a multiple uh, open gear opportunities out there uh, that these equipment can be used uh, for. So. Um, there we go. So highlighted in red this time around. Uh, this is our core focus for today's discussion: the open gear or the, the drive chain for the lubrication piece. So here's your uh, highly recognized original equipment manufacturers: so Allison Ch Chambers, Davenport, F.L. Smith, Fuller, Metso, you know, even Louisville Dryer for the steam dryers. So it's not inclusive as well. So if I left anybody out, that's not on purpose. Um, just kind of gives you an idea as far as the different OEMs that are out there. Absolutely. So uh, today's discussion, so lubrication regimes. Um, 
this is the core focus and then what to look for as far as the most critical out of your lubricant when you're you know comparing one lubricant to another um, so with a mindset of understanding uh, the lubrication regime that you guys uh, look at in open gear applications um, when you run into the boundary lubrication where there's not enough film strength to separate the two um, surfaces of metal where you've got as asperities and stuff the EP additive package is the key component here for that protection. And you'll find that uh, on your product data sheets in a four ball weld and also the four ball wear scar. So the four ball weld is going to be your impact resistance, your separation, your solid film. And then the four ball uh, wear scar is more of your anti wear type of package as well. So uh, these open gears also experience mixed lubrication. So this is where your base oil viscosity becomes uh, a little bit more focused on that one. Uh, and also the four ball weld and the EP added uh, and the four ball wear, uh, wear scar. And then once you get to the hydrodynamic, this is where base oil kind of takes over as far as the viscosity because you're more, more or less running off of the film strength of, of the, the open gear lubricant. So if anything on this presentation the most critical pieces uh to basically kind of focus on when it comes to open gear lubricants these are the fluid kind uh is viscosity viscosity will always be the number one thing but uh, understand there's resistance to extreme pressure the ep that's where your four ball weld is important and then you got resistance to the sliding and the rolling as far as contact is the anti-wear piece uh, and you'll find that uh, on your product data sheet as far as four ball well wear scar. And then something I'm going to throw in here for a loop, and maybe this will open up some dialogue later on in, in the presentation, but FZG test results. This is actually uh, a German testing that, that's come up, for, and we use this for industry standard. But this is more a coefficient of friction measurement. So what this does is, after you know during these tests you're getting a lot of load on this and they're measuring the metal loss so that figure that you get out there as far as kill kilowatt and all that is measuring how much metal has been removed under load under those extremes so the lower the number on that particular fzg test the better now they do have two different styles one for fluid and then there's one for grease so just kind of be aware you know in doing those comparisons, but I didn't keep it on this particular presentation, but I threw it in as a, a goodie. So if you're part of the presentation today, uh, those are some of the things that I, I consider when I look at product data sheets uh, from one open gear lubricant to another. So these are your, your typically your most critical. So before we get off of this one, Carl, is it, I just want to go through these, these three regimes. Um, uh, boundary mixed and hydrodynamic. It, it's basically like the uh, cylinder walls in your car when you start your car, your truck. You're in a boundary mode when when all the oil is in the bottom of the, the oil pan. You're not. You, you don't really have that oil lift coming up into the block very well. Then you go into a mix where it's now starting to pump, and then ultimately into a hydro hydrodynamic state, right? So then you have a full film separation between the, the wall or the ring and the, and the block, right, or the piston. Correct. Absolutely spot on. So, and if we've got any questions, so we'll open it up. What was that, Buck? Uh, same, same thing. Any if anybody had any questions okay. so far? Gotcha. So again, if, if you guys have any questions, feel free to use the little chat and stuff like that. Uh, we'll kind of monitor the questions on the on the uh, presentation. So, anyway, with that being said. Let's keep moving and shaking. So uh, today, most OEMs, as far as the open gear, recommend a fluid type of open gear lubricant. You know, but their uh, their focus is a minimum base oil viscosity for wear protection. And why do they do that? You know, we used to use asphaltics, then greases, and now we're making the transition to the fluid. So fluids help carry out a lot of the load through mixed film lubrication because of the high viscosities of the lubricant now that are used nowadays. So just to give you an idea, you know, that type of thing, you know, ISO 1000, 1500, and then you get into some of these fluids, now they're 28,000, there's 35,000. So there's some really thick fluid out there. Um, and then 
majority of people are moving over to the spray cycles, so they are able to wash off the contaminants, uh, depending on the operating environment of that particular unit. Uh, until we visit it physically or see it or see pictures of it, we really, you know, from there's not one product that's going to fit all applications. So depending on the operating environment, that's very key uh, in, when making lubricant selection. And then as far as the fluids, they do flow out of the gear cover and carry away the, 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 the contaminants. So it's a, it's a process, it's a fluid, it's housekeeping. A lot of this is, uh, you know, we're taking these actions to maximize the life out of that. Uh, it's typically a multi-million dollar piece of equipment, most critical piece of equipment in the entire plant. So there is a lot of eyes at different levels of the organization that look at this stuff. So we pay uh, special attention to this one. And uh, so, but most OEMs uh, do approve of some of the grease type, but if the operating temperatures are too high, those grease types um, are better to switch over to the fluid because they can dissipate the heat away better than what a grease can. So any questions on that one by any chance? Right on. So we'll keep moving on. Uh, but if Don't you be afraid to challenge these guys. <laughs> yeah, Jason has earlier, so keep up the good work. <laughs> All right. So in some of these cases, you know, kennels can be very long. So usually the longer the kennel, the older it is. And the reason for the length was it wasn't as efficient. So more of the efficient kennels and dryers are becoming shorter in length because we've got better technologies out there. So just to kind of give that little tidbit out there, you know, the things that we learn and we share. So I just wanted to pass on the, the education that I've learned uh, recently as well. So, All right, so different methods of open gear lubrication. Let's kind of go through this where uh, you could have sumps, you could have uh, immersion, you could have got transfer of the lubricant, uh, circulation methods, uh, automatic spray lubrication, and then you got transfer uh, lubrication. So, different methods of applying lubricant to the gears. Um, and depending on the age of the equipment, you know, when it was installed, what was installed at the time, uh, some of these times, as far as maintenance, you, you get to inherit the problem and the older technology. Well, how do you work through uh, the challenges and looking at the new stuff and implementing it? So, we get to see all of it. It's kind of fun when you see this. That's a great point because some of the some of this equipment that's in the field out there and in service and in production is you know some of it can be 50 60 years old and the technology used then at the time is the best that they had but um, you know today's technology obviously is getting better um, and try trying to get out of the uh, mode of that's the way we've always done it is is probably the hardest thing to do absolutely so but if there's a will and a way and the effort and you guys want to optimize, um, a lot of the people move into the automatic spray lubrication. Yes, the consumption of your oil will go up if you're used to using a sump, but with the sumps, you collect all the contaminants. And if you're not filtering and doing your housekeeping, you're actually causing more damage than you are uh, good. So these are different techniques. So it all depends on your maintenance schedules and, and the effort that you want to put into it. So. Right there, let's pause right there for a second because I'd like you to talk a little bit, Carl, about the breakdown of the lubrication itself in in a sump mode or in an oil bath mode where the gear is actually going through the bottom of the, say, the guard, for example, that's holding holding the lubricant. As that builds water or contaminants, and I'll stick with water first, um, how how is that oil breaking down and the lubrication properties breaking down because of the because of the water? Well, water water is leading to the oxidation, so it's breaking it down. Uh, depending on, with a lot of these heavier fluids, uh, you might you might end up having oil or your open gear lubricant mixed in with your you know material that you're actually processing, and then the water is going to be sitting on top of it. Uh, typically, when you put water and, and oil together, that's a fluid. The water will go to the bottom because it is heavier. Uh, as far as weight is concerned, so you can drain it out. So if you've seen some of the gear boxes that have the side tubes or the little bowls, you might end up seeing a little bit of water. You can drain that out and then continue going on. Uh, definitely look for your water source where you're getting it. Could be condensation on just the, the operation of the unit uh, because of the humidity in the air is uh, 
pretty high, and then you got hot and cold cycles that creates condensation on the inside. But yeah, typically on an open gear application, if you've got water and contaminating it, it's breaking it down. Um, and depending on the gear, I mean, if, like you see the picture here on the left hand side, it's mixing in and collecting all the contaminants with the open gear. And this is a bad sump. Uh, this is severe. Um, so when we see this type of thing, we're like immediately clean this thing out uh, and and fix it as fast as you can because all you're doing, uh, this particular contaminant, it's kind of like putting sandpaper mixed in with your lubricant. And so you're just sanding down the gear teeth. So, but, you know, and some of this evidence, you know, I've got a couple other pictures over here where you've got some of the open gear that has gone out, you know, from a sump. It's degrading the actual pier that the unit's sitting on. So, as we all know, with concrete and oil, the oil's actually breaking down the concrete. So, the integrity of the pier is uh, compromised. Um, and there's a product that we sell within our arsenal of products. It's our CATS coating uh, 8077. It's an organic kind of cleaner that you can spray on this particular pier where the oil is, let it soak for two to three hours, and come back with a pressure washer mixed with a little bit more of the, the organic cleaner, and it'll actually clean off that stuff. So uh, if you have a need for that and, and your piers are looking like this, uh, that may help out. Um, just clean off the pier and the oil's not breaking down the concrete. That's a great point. When you're looking at your piers and you're seeing degradation in, 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 the, in the pier itself or, or or damage there, that could be it could be related to the lubrication. Yeah. So it's just a housekeeping thing that we kind of help out with when we're looking at the total picture of the of the application. So, and again, when we visit the plants, we kind of look for these little things, point it out, and just kind of make it an action item. Um, so if you guys want to take action, we've got the parts to help you out with. So, good deal. Did I answer your, your question, Buck, or does anybody else have any other kind of questions you've heard yourself? Yeah, so guys, as I'm looking at these, and if I've got a pier, my drive pier, and it's got the bath like that, and it's leaking out all over the place, and I'm starting to see vibrations in my unit, would you all recommend that it's a good thing to go ahead and clean all that out and check your foundation there? before you go into any other steps? It would help, yeah. Because your foundation that you're, you know, the, where this unit's sitting on, it could be the base is not attached to the pier anymore, depending on how bad it is. Buck, yeah, definitely step one is find out. Yeah, well, I would, I would agree. Definitely step one is find out where it's coming from uh, and, and try to, try to stop that uh, first. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, th then we're going to look at fasteners. Um, we're going to look at the anchors, um, the uh, guard itself. So, yeah, a good thorough inspection on it. Yeah. So, again, these are just things that we kind of highlight during our visits. So, um, anything that we can help out and share to, to help things make it run better, more efficient, you know, we, we're willing to do that. So, it's part of our standard procedures. So, all right. Moving on, so uh, Jason's been busy. Uh, they do, Industrial Kennel and Dryer has a spray safe cabinet. You know, this is all assembled in a, you know, one single source cabinet. So everything's included in here. So I don't know, yeah, Buck, do you want to? Yeah, yeah, it just gives you a good visual of what, what you're looking at when you open up one of our spray lamps cabinets or spray bar cabinets. I mean, it's PLC operated. It's, uh, you've got the pump inside of it. It can handle 55 gallon drums or the, or the cakes. Um, you got your mainline air coming in uh, and lube and air lines going out up to the spray bar. These are usually typically positioned um, uh, under the pier, you know, or, uh, under the, or at the base of the pier, I guess I should say, uh, provided that it's not a great distance. You know, we try to keep, we try to keep the distance between that box and the uh, lance where it goes into the to the gear guard somewhere around 25 feet when it's greater than that we get over that then we need a remote box to put up on the uh, on the pier itself so that's just kind of a good visual of what we what you would be looking at from one of our spray lamps um, uh, lubrication cabinets yeah it's nice it's all self-contained so it's a good design 
and also the picture to the right, Jason was kind enough to share that. This is what we're trying to avoid. So when we see these kind of things, I know Industrial Kill and Dryer has the capability to do the repair work on these things, but from a lubrication standpoint, we try and help uh, avoid this situation. So good picture, Jason. Looks awful dry. All right, so, yeah. <laughs> so some of these some applications, well, I actually have an idler. So the key point on this particular slide, I just wanted to point out in uh, our te field technical services team does a really good job of explaining this as well. But, you know, look at the loaded T planks. You know, that's where you need the lubricant. But if you're using a idler wheel that's going back and forth of, uh, across the pinion, look where the lubricant's being applied to the pinion. It's on the unloaded side. So you really don't, don't get a whole lot of lubricant on it, you know, even though it's operating in the bath that's being transferred up there. So is it the, the best method of application for lubricant? Um, I usually see it and I'm like going, I understand the technology and the, the method back then, but with all the new technology that we have now, uh, moving to the spray system or something like that would actually have a, a big benefit on this one. Absolutely, it's it's a application method, <laughs> probably not the best. Yeah, well said. All right, oil circulation versus atomized spray. You know how how effective is the oil circulation method? Um, I've seen some applications to where they've got metal parts floating around and they're trying to filter out the metal parts as far as metal shavings. Uh, so it all depends if they're using the right viscosity of oil to begin with. But um, the concept of the oil circulation is basically to flush the gear set, you know, with a constant flow of the filter, sometimes cooled oil, uh, but it's difficult to filter these really thick fluids. Uh, you're talking sometimes the ISO grade is 15,000 to 28,000 uh, center stokes. That's really thick stuff. So uh, I know we sell or manufacture oil safe units and our filtration uh, units, you know, we usually go up to uh, an ISO 680. And then that's where we stop as far as filtration on, on some of the gear oils because it just, even with a positive type of pump, um, it's difficult to filter or push those uh, fluids through a filter media. So, but anyway, the drawback uh, is one of those as far as uh, circulation, just the filtration. And then uh, some of these may or may not meet the OEM minimum viscosity specifications. So depending on the ambient temperature and the unit, the environment, um, you know, if they call out for a 680, but after you're putting it through here, um, it thins out because of the temperature. Then you're at an ISO 460 and you're already beyond your OEM specifications. So just kind of pay attention to some of those uh, methods if you are using this particular method. Um, but air atomized, uh, this is the most effective way of applying lubricant, whether fluid or grease. Um, and it's ease of maintenance. You got, you get to see the coating, you get to see the spray nozzle, if they're spraying, if they're not, all these things are uh, very visible. So from a maintenance and housekeeping perspective, um, very easy to maintain. And you guys know, uh, when you look at the unit, it's actually being lubricated. And it's a great way to dissipate heat if you've got heat for issues, so, but, uh, I like it because you can actually aim the nozzles and it's more efficient application on the load inside of the tooth flanks, which is what your goal is when you're lubricating open gear applications. You, def you definitely have control. Um, yeah. One thing I want to, before we get too far away, Carl, and we haven't mentioned is, is drip systems. Um, be it, be it in, on gear and pinion, um, you see them on chain driven systems as well. Um, the One of the things that we see a lot of is a drip is set or a amount of drip is set, but that'll vary, you know, as, as you go into the cooler or now as we go in, we're going into the summer months and you had mentioned the viscosity. So that drip may not be the same. Um, and it's really hard to regulate drip systems. That's correct. So, Jason was, uh, was trying to show you some pictures as far as the spray system there at, the, at their training class. So, yep, there it is. So this is where the spray nozzles are 
in this particular application, they're aimed towards pinion on the loaded side. So if you're using fluid, what's nice about it, it'll flow in there, it won't build up on the tooth as far as the roots of the, the tooth. Um, if you're using grease, just be sure where, where the angle is on that one, where you're hitting the top part. You know, basically we, the pitch line or towards the end. So you're you're not wanting to build up lubricant with grease on, on the roots. So just kind of be aware of it. Um, a lot of these systems will be mounted and they're spraying the girth, uh, the bull gear or girth gear. So uh, good job. Thanks, another Jason. Thing to con another thing to consider too, as well as is, is, is a post spray or a post blast of just just air, just to clear the nozzle to avoid you know build up of, of whatever lubricant that you're using make sure you get a, a nice blast uh, post lubricant to keep that nozzle clean yeah typically that'll last between 30 to, to 60 seconds so just make sure it's not one of those 15 seconds and you're done um, go ahead and you know add that 45 to 60 seconds so you get a good purge of air so you're pushing all the lubricant out of that spray nozzle especially if it's atomized Yes, so let's dive into a little bit of the advantages of fluid type and then we'll kind of go over some of the disadvantages um, and feel free to, to add something if we miss something so um, we're not perfect but you know you guys might see something when you're reading through this particular slide going hey have you guys ever thought of this you know so feel free to share some comments as well but some of the advantages of the fluid type of open gear lubricant, you know, you've got the high basal viscosity, which is the primary protector of the wear uh, on the generation of the gears. So keeping that viscosity, and, and you can't compress fluid. So what's beautiful about that is if you've got a really thick one, then the likelihood of those two metal surfaces making contact is very minimal. So, and that basically the high viscosity uh, oil ensures a, a robust film thickness in the high temperature uh, condition. So if you're using a really thick one and then as you apply heat to it, it will thin out. So understand your operating conditions. That's a big, big key thing. And first contaminants, you're always helping them wash away using the fluids. Uh, they readily drain from gear covers, typically. Um, so most of your liquid open gear lubricants, that's the OGL acronym that's referenced here, have a, a clear semi-transparent color. Uh, and they don't have to be removed nor checked for wear. You can kind of see through them, if you will. Um, generally less expensive than grease. Um, you got to remember some of the fluid type is not highly additized with using molly or graphite or whatever solid uh, EP additive package is uh, mixed in with the open gear lubricant from the manufacturer. Um, but yeah, the fluids, you know, rarely incorporate solid additives. You know, their primary focus is using a really good solid. Uh, Actually, I shouldn't say solid on this one, but they use a really good uh, thick base oil for the viscosity and the viscosity improvers. They'll keep it thick, and as the heat uh, rises, it doesn't you know fall apart. And so, but also uh, another good point on the fluids: they do not generate uh, the gear set to tip to root interference, so you don't have any buildup like you do in grease if you're. You know, be careful if you are using grease, you may end up getting a bunch of buildup uh, in the root. So just kind of be uh, privy to that or pay attention to it. Absolutely. Another point, and from a from a maintenance standpoint, from 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 where we're at, I mean, you had mentioned the uh, the fact that they're clear, semi-clear. Uh, you don't have to remove it to check for wear. When we're doing inspections, or when your maintenance teams are doing inspections on your units, and you're having to remove all that grease, maybe maybe freeze blast it off or whatever means or mode that you're using to remove all that grease to do a good gear inspection, good tooth, uh, or excuse me, pinion inspection on, on the teeth. This is very, very, very helpful. Um, and obviously time is money. So when, when you're looking at all the time, effort, and energy that you're putting into removing that grease only to put it back on, and then a year later or whatever your interval is to remove it again. This this is a great alternative to that. You you can easily do your inspections and get an idea of what you're looking at very very quickly. Yeah. So anyway, if you guys want to make some additional comments on the disadvantages, you know, not to be a pessimist, but we all have worked with this stuff. Uh, once you get it on you, it kind of clings to you and sticks to you quite a bit. So uh, it can be messy uh, if you've got a wild spray nozzle that's 
you know, kink and it's, it's spraying off to the left and it's, it's hitting the, the gear guard versus the gear. Uh, if you're spraying fluid on the pinion, it's coming back at you. And you know, those are some of the things that we've seen on the field. Of like, you know, if you do this a little bit of an adjustment, this will help, you know, make it less messy, which is our goal. So, uh, but yeah, just to give you an idea that I have to put that down as far as the disadvantage, uh, just because a lot of times these open gear lubricants in general, it's just the way that it's always been in our industry. They are missing. So, um, and then with the fluids, uh, just from a balance sheet perspective, they are going to have a higher uh, application or consumption rate than the grease uh, open gear lubricants uh, because they are washing contaminants off and you constantly are replenishing them. Uh, if you're using a sump, uh, your your consumption rate may not be high, but the amount of contaminants that you're running that fluid through, you may end up causing more damage uh, if you're not filtering the, the fluid. And then uh, when you do work with really thick viscosity, it's difficult to pump this through your pump system. So to get the, the lubricant there, you got to work extra hard. So if you got additional link from the pump to the actual spray nozzles, um, definitely increase the diameter of the lines. Uh, you don't really want to go with the really thin ones because if we run into problems where you're putting heat tracers on your lube, lube lines, you're th thinning out your viscosity. So when it gets to your spray nozzle, you might be thinking on your product data sheet, that's a 28,000 tenistoke fluid that I'm throwing on there. But when you heat it, that 28,000 tenistoke fluid is now 1,000 tenistokes. A little drastic on the measurements. That's not accurate as far as what I've seen personally. But I mean, I'm just trying to give you an idea. When you do heat up this fluid, it will thin out. So don't think you're spraying on a 20,000 uh, 28,000 centistoke fluid when after you heat it up there, it could be a 5,000 centistoke fluid. So, uh, asphaltic fluids, you know, they, they can, uh, they tend to dry out and they build up as far as the spin on the open gear guards and once or twice a year, you got to sit there and clean that stuff off. It is not easy to do. Uh, I've seen some plants to where they haven't touched it for years. And it's so coated, you almost need a jackhammer to, to get through the opening of the door. So it's it's difficult. So and from a maintenance standpoint, but I'm sure you can you know chime in on this one. Uh, removing that stuff can be a a day or two project if you will during. No, uh, and I, yeah, and that's what I meant by it. sometimes you just have to freeze freeze blast it to get it to get it off. But it it, it, it you know when yeah. you. Fluid being messy, well, we all know asphalt it can be messy. It's the gift that keeps on giving. You know, I mean, a little bit goes a long way, and then next thing you know, you got, you're carrying it in the house, truck, everywhere else you go. So, um, no, that's it, a great point about them getting, as they harden or over time getting hard, um, it's tough to deal with. And very messy on, if we do have a leak in the guard, very, very messy on the pier, on the pier tops. Those are, those are those are safety concerns. Yeah. Uh, speaking of messy, I know we I referred to it earlier, but yeah, you know, when you apply uh, the lubricant to the pinion, because it's moving faster than the open gear or girth gear, uh, that can fling back at you. It becomes you know um, messy, and also you've got to do it more often because it's you know moving faster. So that could result in a higher consumption. So just kind of watch that if, if that's how you guys are, are using it today. Uh, some of the full synthetic oils, the PAOs, you know, they may have a lower viscosity index than the asphaltic. Uh, they're nice at 1,000, 1,500, or I've seen some of them about 3,500. Well, the asphaltics and your resin and polymer-based fluids, uh, you know, those things can be 28,000, cinestokes, 18, 15,000. So as you put them closer to the operating temperature, those really watch yourself at the uh, on the data sheets. Look how uh, 40, 40C is typically what we measure it, and also 100C. So look at that. Uh, if you put on a graph with the temperature and the, the thickness, look how uh, aggressive that slope is. The flatter the slope, the better the shear stability of that fluid is. Uh, but look at the, the two, you know, the, the 100C. Uh, value and that's how thick that oil is when it's in a heated operated 
type of environment. So um, usually the thicker or looking at that value uh, will pay. Uh, that'll help you out when selecting you know, between lubricants and stuff like that. That's the film strength as far as the, the thickness of the, the base oil viscosity. So, and some oils are very clear. Uh, so when using an open gear lubricant that is extremely transparent, it's difficult to see the coating on there. Uh, so sometimes you gotta slow it down and I don't know, uh, you get a lot of feedback. I mean, you've got, like you've used, you've seen some open gear uh, lubricant that is really clear on the maintenance of that. How difficult was that to view the, the coating? Did you need any special equipment? Well, what, te what tends to happen is when it's very clear, like that, um, you, you don't see it. So the, the question then becomes, am I putting enough on it? So your consumption rate typically goes up and you're using a bit more than you need to. It's not necessarily bad oil, but it, it's very, very hard to, to know how much you're applying. Um, or, or the idea is it, it, it's not getting enough because you, you can't see uh, how much oil is on it, albeit you're going through your, typically going through your spray system. Uh, the semi-clear, yeah. semi-trans, what we've nicknamed the sort of clear, um, it's it's not fully transparent. It's not very clear, but you're able to you are able to clearly see how much is being applied to the gear. Yeah. All right, let's move on. So we've been talking about fluids. So the next one's going to be talking about uh, greases. Uh, they are out there. Uh, there are you know applications out there where a grease is actually better than the fluid. Um, so if you've got high dusty environments without a gear guard. Uh, and it's open into the elements. Fluids may not be the best uh, option there. Sometimes the grease is actually a better play. So, you know, we've got a full arsenal of products for a variety of different applications from a manufacturer standpoint. Uh, so, uh, we're kind of open to seeing everything out there, and we're constantly developing with new technologies as far as uh, how we can best provide lubricant and protect the asset. So, just understand that. You know, there are some advantages and disadvantages as far as grease. Um, so grease types, they do use a low base oil. However, they highly additize this thing, uh, which is really good from an EP standpoint. You know, they put the mollies in, the graphites, uh, polymers. I mean, they've, they've got thickeners and tackifiers to help keep the product, you know, on the gear itself. Um, so the biggest key thing when I, I see people working with grease you do reduce the uh, consumption rate. You know, there's less waste because you're not applying as much. Uh, sometimes it is a cleaner environment depending on if you're atomizing it uh, when you're spraying onto the gear set. Uh, you know, it could be messier depending on you know, the application, but typically it is cleaner. Uh, you run these a little bit drier versus the, the liquid form. So you're not, you know, if you see your grease that's wet on the gear, you're probably applying too much. So beware of building up, you know, lubricant or grease in the, in the roots of the, the pinion, because that will cause more damage than it will do uh, anything else as far as protecting. Uh, also, grease, uh, an automatic uh, lube system is you know, easier to pump uh, because it's got the, the lower uh, base oil to work with. Uh, just understand when you're pushing solids through the spray nozzles, as uh, Buck was mentioning earlier, Definitely have your after purge for uh, blowing air after that. That way, if you can keep help keep your nozzles clean. Uh, most lubricant manufacturers claim that the higher wear protection with the open gear grease. Uh, this can be true in some cases, uh, but when you start working with our Envirolube XC Extreme or the Sorta Clear uh, product, that may not be the case. Um, the resins and the polymer that we use in that product act uh, pretty much like a molly, but they're not considered a solid uh, additive. So that's nice when it comes to, if you're worried about clogging up things and you know, as far as your spray nozzles in your system, there is no solids in the environment that's actually extreme. So uh, also greases, some of the advantages. Uh, most grease open gear lubricants have gray or dark black color, which are easy to evaluate. You know you're getting a good coating on there because you can barely see, you know, the, the tooth or the shiny part. Uh, There's less sling off. So when you add the, the tack fire and the thickener in there, when you spray that grease on there, uh, there's going to be less sling off than what you're using with 
if you were using a fluid. So, Buck, you got anything else to add to that one that you've seen? Well, I would I would say too, also with the with the XC Extreme um, with the polymers in it, that it helps to promote kind of a lapping uh, effect. So it, it encourages or promotes um, um, improvement in. Uh, it's not gonna it's not gonna make a, a bad gear set better, um, but it's gonna help promote um, a softening of those asperities and the smoothing of the asperities in in an, in an already worn gear and pinion set. So. Um, whereas with the thickeners and, and, and additives and a grease, it's not likely uh, going to happen. Yeah, a good point. Uh, we call it surface smoothing. So um, it's really neat how this product works with the polymer, but if you got really bad uh, pitting and stuff like that, and you put your thumb, you run across the gear teeth, and it's real, you've got some sharp edges after running uh, this particular product about 300 hours to 500 hours and you're, if you're running 24 7 give it a couple of weeks of run time and then go back over there you know shut down for you know five two minutes if you can depending on production schedules of course uh, but use that same kind of concept of sliding your thumb across that gear teeth and you'll notice you won't have those sharp edges anymore so and all you're doing is using the same you know, using the lubricant and using the physics as far as the gear teeth and they're softening uh, those sharp edges, you know, during operation, and it's basically a, a pretty cool component as far as an advantage uh, of using the, the fluid. So, good point. I uh, appreciate that. So, uh, so grease disadvantages. All right. So, buying this stuff, it's probably a higher cost than asphaltic fluids or any kind of fluid type because they have add so much more of the EP additives. The moly and the graphite do not come cheap. It's probably one of the most expensive components of making an open gear lubricant. So just, if you don't know that, well, now you know, and the industry's pretty true to, to that particular concept. So uh, also, greases do not flow. You know, if you're running, if you're trying to run these things wet, you're probably trying to prove it wrong. But if you are running it that wet, then you're not applying the grease correctly. Um, so that might be something where you can cut back on your time. Uh, but yeah, these things should be running a little bit more dry than a visual wet, so they do not flow, uh, and they will build up on the gear covers. Um, so just kind of be aware of where the stuff is going and how it's being channeled. Uh, it's not designed to go into a, a containment. You know, typically they'll fall, uh, the ball up and fall down, you know, underneath the pinion, and uh, you'll do all your maintenance at the very bottom of those uh, of the gear set thing on your application. So. Uh, if over applied, you know, this is where your your, your tip to root uh, interference comes into play. So typically there is spacing. So watch your pitch line and all that, but watch, you know, that you're not building up grease uh, in that channel as far as the roof. So just kind of keep that um, center point of, of applying those things. And this could be just how you're spraying the, the grease onto the, the gear set. Um, if you're spraying it down in the roof, you're definitely going to start building up. So adjust your angle just slightly to where it's a pitch line to the top of the teeth where you're hitting that. Um, so most op open gear lubricants do have a, a, a gray to dark black color. So they're easy to, you know, check the coating. But if you want to check the wear, you got to wipe them off. So typically you got to stop the unit, wipe it down, and then you kind of look for all your wear points. So that is a disadvantage because you do have to stop the unit. So during outages or during slow time where you've got you know, a small window of time to, to do your evaluation, you know, that's great. Uh, but the fluids, you know, versus a, a grease, this is a, probably one of the key uh, advantages versus disadvantages of, of you know, fluid versus a grease. And then lastly, this is one thing that I kind of want to mention. Some of the uh, original equipment manufacturers, gear manufacturers, recommendations such as fault, you know, their first choice is a fluid type lubricant. So when you got the OEM kind of leading with this fluid type of lubricant, and then you're coming in with this, oh, well, I need to use grease. Yeah. Well, you're going against tried and true type of method of lubricating with a fluid, and then yeah, okay, grease, you know, even uh, Falk is a little reluctant, but they will uh, approve it. So just understand some of the environments that these units operate in, 
Greece might be the better choice. So there are pluses and minuses of a flu in a Greece. That's kind of why we want to go through these two slides to kind of give you an idea. If you've got additional comments to add, uh, please feel free or if you've got some questions, uh, we're here to answer as a group. So anything Any else? Any questions so far? We have nothing yet. Tim. That's okay. We're we're probably gonna have to put money out there for the first question, and then we'll see it fill up <laughs> pretty quick. <laughs> so, anyway, let's move on. So, uh, open gear sort of clears. So we've kind of discussed the fluid versus the grease and the three critical areas. So, what's unique about this product out there is the chemistry, the balance of it that, that it has. So a reason why I say that is um, the synthetic resin the polymer, you know, they're designed to help, uh, up, you know, it's got the optimum film strength under severe conditions, you know, with the heat and the load. It does have a high viscosity index. Uh, so the film strength is severe compared to most competitors. So uh, the base wall component uh, for for pumpability and sprayability is about 3,500 to 4,500 sinistokes. So it's easy to spray out there. Um, but the polymer and the resin that we use has a capability of going to 100,000 sinistokes. Now, is it going to achieve 100,000 sinistokes after you spray it onto the gear and do a full revolution of the, the gear gear? Probably not. So you're looking probably in the 30 to 35,000 sinistokes. Uh, so, you know, just think about that, you know, you've got 4,500 centistokes that you're pumping, so you're easy on your pump, you spray on the girth, your, uh, you atomize it, and then the, the actual fluid will thicken up as you're doing the full rotation around that uh, unit. So, you could possibly achieve the 30,000 to 35,000 centistokes thickness. So, that's where that strength and where that uniqueness comes into play. Now, uh, a kiln gear is going to probably achieve that, but when you're working with a ball mill that's running a heck of a lot faster, you're probably, all right, here's 4,500 centistokes. By the time that she spins around, uh, you might be at 7,500 to 10,000 centistokes. So just to, you know, speed comes into play on this one. So just to give, give you guys something to anticipate. Uh, but it is, this particular one's a robust li liquid soluble extreme pressure additive. So there's no solid in this thing. So you don't have to worry about clogging nozzles. So if you do the after spray like you're supposed to, there's nothing really in there from a lubricant manufacturer standpoint to clog the, the nozzles. So if you're going to clog nozzles, you're probably gonna get that with some kind of contaminant from the material that you're, you're working with. So uh, base oil viscosity, it's easier to, to pump. Uh, it is a semi-translucent, so the coating is easy to see and evaluate. Uh, you can hit this thing with an infrared. You don't get any of the, the, the flashback. Um, you can also use, uh, you know, different components and different visual uh, things to help you out with as far as speed light and all that kind of good stuff. So, but this will give you an idea. Plus, this product, after you spray it and it's gone through there, it does not dry it out. It remains fluid, so it'll drain from your gear co uh, covers uh, and go into whatever you're, you're doing for collection. So that could be a pail, it could be a keg. Uh, sometimes if it's a real huge thing, you guys don't want to you know, work with it a whole lot as far as mess with it. It could be going all the way down into a 330-gallon tote. Uh, so maybe once or twice a year, you're, you're disposing it. And um, what's nice of this one, you can dispose of it as a used uh, oil. Um, typically when you get in the asphalt and stuff like that, it's considered hazardous waste. So, you know, check your local regulations and stuff like that, but you know, just know that. And plus, this product is not banned anywhere uh, in any country as far as use. So, it's uh, one of those less harmful, non-caustic type of things. So, Buck, you got anything that I might have missed? No, I was thinking about throwing out three hats, three of these good-looking industrial under our hats, first three questions, if that'll work. <laughs> interaction here. May have to add gift cards to that, man. But yeah, good place to start. <laughs> so, good deal. 
All right, so open gear lubricant options. You know, we, we do manufacture a variety, so you know, there are some old school folks that still want to use asphaltic heavy fluid. We still manufacture that. Um, EnviroLube XE Extreme, this is our resin polymer heavy fluid. Uh, that is uh, industrial kennels, sort of clear uh, lubricant that they're promoting. Uh, we do offer SureTac 2000, so if you're still looking for the grease type, uh, we do have that one, it's, you know, basically clay-based thickener with heavy oil, and then we add the, the solids uh, in there for the ad pack and the EP protection. But uh, there's some additional um, options for open gear lubricants for the rotary vessels. We've got GearMate 1000. It's a lithium soap, heavy oil, solid additives. We've got SureTick, uh, SureStick at 800. It uses an aluminum complex uh, soap thickener. Um, and then we've got the cap one gold. So if you are running those sump systems out there and you need a full synthetic PAO, we do still have that one. So anyway, just to give you a, a, an option as far as all the products that we do carry. So Carl, you had mentioned several of these, you know, and we're, we're seeing the EnviroLubes, uh, the extra tax and gear and pinion type, uh, type systems. What about in our chain drip for our chain driven and their teams, what are we, what are oh, we best for? for uh, excellent question, because I know there's a lot of them out there. So let's move on to the next slide. Ta-da! Great Should transition, and you didn't even do that on purpose. So we do have some chain-driven uh, dryers uh, out there. And so we offer a variety of different uh, chain lubricants. So the open chain that we typically use is mineral-based. Uh, it cleans the, the bushings. Uh, we've got Decathlon, which is a conveyor type of chain. This is where you know, higher temperatures are usually in play, so you need a PAO that's a little bit more stable during the high temperatures. Um, and then there are some that's extremely high temp. Now we're talking about 250 degrees plus. We use a synthetic pack. You know, it's a polyethylene black oil. Um, and we do have one that's either with or without solid additives, depending on the, the application. And then we've got some dry film. We've got Molly uh, dry film that becomes, you know, that comes in an aerosol can. They can spray in there. Um, if you're working in a food plant and you need, you know, your food grade, uh, we've got the medallion line of our food grade manufacturing process, and there's a chain oil there. It's mineral oil, so it's a white oil that's uh, NSH1 graded. And then we also have uh, Earthkeeper chain oil. So if you're close to anything that needs to be biosynthetic or biodegradable applications, uh, we do sell those type of fluids as well. Best application method for any of the chains, right? Either. Yes. All right. So, but yeah, I mean, that's application wise. Uh, I would. Some people will drip this thing on, some people will spray it on. Um, so just to give you an idea, you know, there's different ways of doing this. Some people run it in a bath, it all depends on the application, but find the slack uh, side of the application to apply the lubricant. That way it'll have a chance to where it'll wick in there into the, into the bushings and stuff like that. And so other than that, we are good to go. A great point. Any questions? Lubricate on the slack and at the tension yeah. side of the chain. Absolutely. Good deal. I guess nobody wanted your hats, but all right. So put a feather in it, man. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but uh, let us know if this has been helpful. If you guys find this useful, we'll, we'll continue. I know next week uh, we've got another edition of this one you know so if there's any particular things that you guys are concerned with after going through the basic lubrication and just seeing some of the open gear or, or chain applications and you guys have some challenges out there feel free to reach out to either myself or buck um, and get those things posted to us or share with them and, and we can address those on a one-off basis if you will and we're here to help as, as best as we can